I know them personally, right? I know them up in the squad. I know most of them. And they were put on this facade that they were staunch Republicans and they were far from it. They were all working for the other side. Oh, my view is that this went the whole way to 10 down the street. I'm convinced that the Scrapatici stuff I went the whole way to 10 down the street. Okay, um, for, th thank you very much for joining me. Um, appreciate you taking the time. Um, I do hope um, uh, I do hope that um, the the kind of renewed and re reinvigorated interest in the in the subject has been uh, has been good for the book. Um, it's a good place to start. If, if anyone hasn't, number one bestseller. Nice one, nice one, very good. As it should be, excellently put together, excellently written. If anyone now, if anyone does want like uh, the most the most complete uh, context that you can get on SCAP and uh, the ISU. Um, you should uh, you should read the book. I'll put a link in the description. It's it's excellent. Um, for anyone now who may be completely new to it or just needs a bit of a of a refresher course, you might give us like a very compressed version of um just kind of who who Steak Knife uh, Scapatici was a compressed version of um of Steak Knife and the the ISU if if you could. Okay, Freddie Scapatici was born in 1846. In the markets area of well in Belfast, um, he came from uh, obviously an Italian Irish family, very very decent Italian Irish family, hard working people. Um, he was in his youth a thoroughway. He was um a guy who would been who would have been in fights. Uh, he was actually brought up uh, before the courts for fighting with uh, him and his, him and a friend. Attacked, well, the, got into an, alt an altercation with some Protestants, and he ended up, he ended up in front of, of, of the judge. I think he got a, a very made sentence, but nonetheless, he was he was a punchy sort of a guy. He was involved in rows. He was very much off the street. Um, uh, he was in, uh, and he was a bricklayer. He learned his trade as a bricklayer. He's also a very talented footballer, and actually went for a trial with Nottingham Forest. In England, uh, he learned his trade as a bricklayer. Um, he got married in eighteen sixty six to a lovely lady called Sheila. And um, in eighteen sixty nine, he, when the troubles broke out in Northern Ireland, the North, call it what you will, when the troubles broke out, um, he joined the Provisional IRA when it formed in nineteen seventy. And he soon rose to the rank uh, of OC of, of, of an IRA company in the markets. OC is officer commanding the main man. He was a prodigious ape of a guy, very, 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 very much the sort of a guy who would come out of the room. Um, while other guy, while other folk, well, comrades or whatever, were maybe out on an ape getting getting drunk or whatever. He didn't. He he had his paint and he sat over that paint all night and watched everybody. He was a sort of a guy who who garnered attention. Right? People looked at him and they and there was an aura of of menace about him. Anyway, he got in turn and tournament without trial began on the eighth of August. 1971, and Freddie was one of the first people arrested. He was actually arrested that morning, 9th of August, 1971. And over the next five years, he was held for four years, the next five years of internment. He was held for four years and three months. That's without a charge. And he got out in 1975, December 1975. That's right to the very end I held him. And um, he was... He got out and he, he got into, um, he, he was a builder, he got into building, he got into a, a, a very serious tax fraud um, and he was getting really good money at it and uh, he rejoined the IRA. No, he didn't wish to rejoin in the IRA, he, but he eventually did. In 77, he got out roughly around late 75, 76, 77 the IRA reorganized. They used to, their, their, their traditional structure was that of based on the British Army structure, brigade company, a brigade battalion and company. 
And then after that, there uh, it was decided to embrace a cell structure. Cell structure being a very a much smaller structure, uh, five or six operator, operators, uh, five or six guys who would be in operations, smaller and, and uh, enhanced either and harder to infiltrate. And along, alongside this here, the leadership decided to form a new company called the, uh, the, the Internal Security Unit, the ICU. Um, and and they, this, yes. this, sorry? Uh, ISU. Sorry? You, 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 you said ICU, ISU. ISU, I beg your pardon, ISU, yeah, Internal Security Unit, yeah. And this was, um, this was made up of very experienced IRA volunteers, guys who'd been there from day one, who'd been and who were older, basically who were older than uh, the the young lads like myself who were who had come along. These guys were older, and uh, it was they were. It was decided. It was it was decreed that these would be far more suitable to to be in this unit. Scapatici was older. Scapatici was seven years older, eight years older than I. So, anyway, the unit was formed. Its, its dream it was to hunt out informers and hunt out agents and were discovered to, to execute them. Its other remit was to... Um, Debrief everyone coming out of the interrogation centres. People were uh, people were arrested uh, habitually, questioned about incidences, and then when they came out, the the the, the internal security unit would have debriefed them. Anyway, so they started in 77, 78, and Freddie was number two in this unit to a man called John Joe McGee. And right from the word go, right from the get go, bodies started appearing in Belfast. And, and country roads up and down the country. And to all intents and purposes, this seemed to be a very successful unit. They seemed to be catching a lot of farmers and, and the nations because that was the measure of their success. The measure of their success was how many people they executed, strange as it may be, but that's what it was. And because there was people showing up left uh, all over the place, they earned a nickname in the press, the Nottingham Squad. The idea being that their victims were traditionally shot in the back of the head or the nut, hence the nutting squad. And Freddie was in there right from the word go. And, and, and we now know that it was in the round uh, late 77, early 78, that he was turned or that he became a British agent. We don't know the exact circumstances whereby he became. He was, uh, he, he turned, he went, to, he went to work for the British. But we knew that it was in the round that time. So literally from the get-go, from the formation of the internal security unit, Freddy Scavatici was working for the other side. And his code name was Steak Knife. Okay, very good. Yeah, we'll we'll get into the actual report. Um one of one of I think the biggest takeaways in the report is that um Scapatici is is discussed, but he's discussed um in relation to a perjury case. Um, where he he signed affidavits, um, basically saying that he he wasn't a British agent or wasn't state knife. There, there was a perjury case going on. There was also the um, his uh, his 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 extreme porn case, which which we kind of discussed ourselves. Um, okay, so so other than that, um, on page forty seven, two point five, it says the truth about steak knife. Sorry, the truth about the identity of steak knife will have to be officially confirmed at some point, but I'm not able to address it in this interim report. I will have to leave it to my final report. Um, yeah. it, it goes on in other places to say that the reason for this is because there's ongoing, um, there's ongoing like prosecutions that they brought forward. I don't know if that then means that the final report can't name him until they've been settled. Um, the, the final report's supposed to be in two to three months. Um, so, so I don't know if this means that uh, until they get settled, they can't name him. What, what, what do you think? No, these, he hasn't been named because there's a policy called NCMB. No claim, no blame. That's British Army policy, or British government policy, whereby they don't claim uh, who is working for them or who isn't working for them. Um, 
which meant that that um, uh, the Canova team could investigate an agent called Steak Knife, but they couldn't identify Steak Knife as Freddy Scappatici because the government policy um, um, was, 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 was different. The government policy says you're not allowed to. So that's that's the position in that. Now, Boucher made his dissatisfaction with that very patent. He was very loud on, and he made it, and, I mean, you read between the lines, there was no ifs or buts about it. He said that as far as he was concerned, Steak Knife was identifiable, and everyone, everybody who thought they knew who Steak Knife was, wasn't far off the mark. So he let it, he let it, he let it be known in no uncertain terms that Scapatici was Steak Knife. Whether or not the British Army changes its policy or not, is in, uh, the British government is another matter. I don't personally think that they will, because where would that end for them? You don't think they'll name him at all? It, that would mean that would mean that he's contradicting that the team is contradicting what they said. I mean, they did say uh, we'll have to leave this to my final report. So I mean, they would have to be contradicting this one. Well, the point the, the point is you have to consider is this: if they if, for example, if Butcher were to say that Freddie Scapatici and Steak Knife are one and the same person. That, is, that would be a breach of the policy of NCMB. And that would mean that in other cases, the same protocol could be followed. You know, so it would have implications that wouldn't just stop with uh, Scapatici and Steak, or vis a vis Steak Knife. It would, it would have implications in other cases. And the thing about the thing that Boucher also said, I can't remember the exact page, but he says there were more than one agent in the in the Nutting Squad and in the Internal Security Unit. So it would have impl- it would have implications in relation to that person. Um, we don't know who that is. We we have strong suspicions, right? Uh, and in fact, there's actually more. Um, um, the 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 guy who 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 heard it, Steak Knife. Yeah, he was a member of the force reaction unit. The Ian Hurst. Ian Hurst. Ian Hurst was interviewed last week, and he says that there was quadruple agents at play in the at least in in, in the internal security unit. Right. So if if you out Scapatici, then the other three guys would be vulnerable as well. That's why I, I don't think they'll be too keen on out anyone. Interesting. Okay, I, I was going to ask you. You you don't hold out. You you don't hold out hold out any uh hope for the the final one naming him. Not that I mean. Look, it, it they they should officially do it because because it's the truth and stuff. But it's not as if anyone is learning any new information. You, you know, we we all know who it is anyway. So, well, that's 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 the truth, but. But I, I, I think, I mean, I would, I would like all agents to be out of, no matter where they are, no matter who they are, if I had my way, they'd all be out. But unfortunately, I'm never going to have my way. But the point is, I'm not confident at all that they will even out, out, um, out Scapatici a steak knife. And as you say, everybody knows it's him. But the press, I, I think the issues for the press are 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 quite are, are quite profound and and probably much larger. Uh, how's it going, everyone? Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to uh, to ask for your help, actually, uh, as the audience. My aim here with the the troubles related uh, episodes is to present like a well rounded, uh, well rounded and multi perspective view of uh, of the troubles of the, of the conflict in the north. Um, if there's anyone living that you think I should speak to, anyone who may have been passed to, to do an episode about, there might be a book on it, um, any instances during the conflict, um, for example, I'm trying to get in contact with the survivor of the, the Kingsman massacre. My aim with the, the troubles related episodes of, of this podcast is to present like a well-rounded and multi-perspective uh, view on the conflict. By no means do, do I want it to kind of seem partisan or, or one-sided or anything. 
If there's any figures, um, li living or dead, within the conflict that you think I should examine, um, be it an interview with them or an, or an author about them, uh, please let me know. Any events that that you think I should be covering, um, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get in contact with the uh, survivor of the Kings Mill massacre, for example. Um, any kind of professions that that you think I'm overlooking that were that were kind of prevalent within the. The troubles. I mean, I, I'd love to speak with someone who was uh, like a, a medic or an ambulance staff at the time, uh, more journalists who covered the conflict than were there, uh, maybe wives of um, of prisoners, loyalist and and Republican, obviously more more paramilitaries um, themselves. Uh, any any themes or forces within the conflict that, that you think um, that you that, that you just like to hear about or you think maybe I'm overlooking? Um, in the future, I, I have a few kind of lined up. I've um, like ex ex SAS, ex FRU, ex bomb disposal, uh, more authors, of course. Um, but if there's anyone at all that you think I'm overlooking or should be spoken to, has an interesting perspective, um, please let me know. Uh, my email is in the description. Uh, you can leave a comment on YouTube um, or if you're listening on, on uh, Spotify, th th there's a space where you can type as well. Um, if you if you do enjoy the show, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please subscribe and leave a like, maybe share it with someone who might like it. Thank you very much. And back to the episode. Fair enough. We're, okay, we're, now that we're into the actual report ourselves, can you uh, give us an impression there of what what your expectations were going in and how they were or were not met? Well, as you know, John, you're very au fait with the book. Um, and in the book, I really speak my secret more in September. And the main thrust of that book, as far as I was concerned, was that members of the British intelligence services, right, um, acquiesced with the IRA Army Council in the murder of British and, and Irish citizens. Now, that was back in September when I released that book. I was talking to journalists and all they were, they were scratching their heads and they were saying, wow, that's, they're not really going to say that either. But I had got in and said, I had not said information. I had people who were talking directly to Boucher and he was very strong. And that's exactly what he was saying. He was saying, I'm going to make it very clear that members of the uh, of the British security uh, intelligence community, vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the tasking and coordinating group, and I need to explain this, but John, it'll take me a minute. Tasking and coordinating group was the overall, the overarching intelligence group that ran all intelligence, and all operations in the North, Right, they, 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 all, all information, all intelligence went up the lane from agents to their handlers. Eventually, ended up on their desk, and they then actioned it or did not action it as they seemed fit. If, for example, there was a chance to ambush an IRA uh, um, unit out on a, out an operation, they they set that up. Alternatively, there were occasions when. They could have saved lives. They could have saved the road agent slaves, right? Freddie and those around him who were also um, agents habitually, when someone was arrested, told their handlers um, who was arrested, where they were being held, who was holding them, right? And and up and up the lane to this task and coordinating group, they then had an opportunity. They then had a decision to make. Do we send in the army or the police to rescue the person who's about to be executed? Or do we let that execution go ahead? The consequences of stopping it means that potentially we run the risk of losing the, the our agent or, or compromising his either identity or his effectiveness. And invariably they just said, let the guy go. Let the, let the person be executed. And that's what I said in my book. That was the thrust of my book. And it caused ruptures. Believe me, people couldn't accept that the police were capable of that. And then lo and behold, that's exactly what Butcher says. Butcher comes straight out with that and says exactly the same thing. And I'm going to read it out because it's important. If you don't mind. Um, the UK government should acknowledge and apologize 
who bereaved families and surviving victims, affected by cases where an individual was harmed or murdered because they were accused or suspected of being an agent, and where this was preventable, or where the perpetrators could and should have been subjected to criminal justice and were not. Those were absolutely devastating lines because here was the chief constable, an English chief constable, right? Who had carried out this investigation in Ireland. And what he was saying was that those murders were preventable and they were not prevented. And that left those on the task and coordinating group, the special branch, or you see special branch, MI5, and the force reaction unit. That left them vulnerable to the charge of facilitating the IRA Army Council in the murder of these people. And that's what was devastating about, about Canova. Um, everything else, there's some great stuff on it. Um, but that was the overarching, uh, that was the overarching facet of it that the, the sensational one, for want of a better word, that a, a British police force acquiesced in the murder of citizens. On that note, actually, I, I suppose it'd be a good time to say um, I spoke. Um, a, a, anyone's watching this might have seen um, my episode with with Seamus Carney. It's my it's the, the most most viewed um uh, video on the channel by by far. Um, he's obviously okay. So the the report. Um, or sorry, the, the team like had a lot of coordination and meetings with like the families of, of the various victims being investigated. Uh Sh Seamus being one of them. I, I, I double checked all this now. I'm 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 okay to I'm okay to say it. Um but yeah, they, they kind of they verbally confirmed like a few things uh to Seamus that, that are quite interesting. He he said it's all right to share. Okay, the first being these were all yeah, th these were all um verbally confirmed in a meeting like a few days before Canova came out. So firstly, um, the internal security uh, unit had to be invited in that that they that they confirmed with him. And um, secondly, um, like like you said, they verbally confirmed with him that Michael Carney's life could have been saved. Um, there was also they also made reference to actually the the interview I I did with him. Um, they said that the general narrative that he put forward in in that podcast is true no no specifics now or anything but they, they said the general narrative is true and also and this okay so the, the following information is coming from an sb50 farm um they said that michael carney um was shot and killed uh, mid prayer um there were two gunmen um and they fired a total of three bullets um two of them were from uh, 45 and one from uh, a 38 and also, I I I don't think this this next part is is like new or anything, but um, there'll be family reports in in two to three months for each uh for each family, and also the final report should be should be out around the same time, but needs to be security cleared by MOD. So yeah, God, that was um, who that was uh, that was big to hear. I I was quite surprised that they would like verbally confirm such uh su such such information with them, you know. Well, as I say, I wasn't surprised when it came out in the report. I was actually surprised when I got it initially, when I was reading the book. But um, that it came out in the report wasn't such a surprise. Do you, do you know what I did? I mean, not surprising, but absolutely breathtaking. The fact that those who were holding, and from the 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 the, the nodding squad who were who were holding Michael made two calls to their handlers and said to them, this 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 young fella, Mike, he's only 20. This was a kid. This young me lad hadn't seen any life at all. This kid's going to get shot dead on two different occasions. And they knew where the house was in Dundalk. And that went straight to this task in the coordinating group. And they didn't even tell the guards. Right? It's worth mentioning. Sorry, it's worth mentioning. He was, he was held for like a... I think, don't quote me exactly, but I think around 16 days. So it's not That's as... Right. It was over four nights. It was over two weeks, right? But they didn't even tell... The, they knew where he was being held. They knew he was open, right? They could have told the guards and stopped this process like that, and they didn't. And this was a... This, 
Well, I think innocent kid had nothing to do with nothing. Well, he was in the IRA, but he had nothing to do with being an informer. And yet they took him out and, and they shot him dead. Uh, on, on, on the, He was shot dead on the word of these British agents. These weren't pristine IRA men following a code of honour. These were British agents who were working to a British agenda. And that's the, that's the big one here. And another one was so we guy called McKernan, Anthony McKernan, who was picked up and brought to a house in Beachmount. And again, two calls were put in to uh, handlers, the through handlers. And they again, they were told that this lad McKernan has been held in such and such a house in Beachmount and that A, B and C are in the house with him. And again, they were given ample opportunity to step in and see if that see young McKernan, and he was shot dead as well, you know. And it, 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 and it goes on and on and on. And then there's a lad called Brunner from Ardoin, who uh, the the lad Brunner, Anthony Brunner, and, and Michael Kearney both got apologies from the IRA. But the lad Brunner. Two calls were put in about him to the Pascal and Coordinating Group. And once again, they just let him. They let the process go through its course. And the lad was shot dead. You know, and at this stage, I'm not too sure how many people could have been saved. But it, it appears to me uh, that that it's well into double figures. Um, and and then this, is, this is a would-be police force. John, this is the killer in all of this. This is the forces of law and order allowing citizens to be actively murdered. And that's what's so shocking about the whole thing. Now, she Seamus now obviously has his own um um has his own belief about uh why why his brother was killed. Um he he he's of the he's of the belief that it, that his brother was uh was intentionally intentionally set up in order to cover for um to cover for another informant and make it look like okay we got the informant because because it was him but in re but in reality it's still there there was one part uh god where was it there's a part of the report where they go into um operational failings and it's about uh god let me find it, it, it it's about it's about the closest we get to to kind of any any sort of like specifics, yeah, okay. So so the the closest to like exact to, to actual actual examples is he gives like the the section is operational failings, and they give like six anonymized examples of of different different types of, of failings by security forces. Uh, example number two, I, I'm I'm on, on page one ninety. Um, it's a the provisional IRA held and interrogated a man at an address. Uh, for days before shooting him dead, before he was murdered, the army uh, passed intelligence to REC Special Branch, given the location where he's being held and the identities of those responsible. Special Branch did not act or pass it on to investigators in, in an apparent attempt to protect the source information. That probably refers to like a, a bunch of them. I'm sure there was plenty like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was also in, in terms of... Uh, in terms of like law enforcement not doing a very basic bit of due diligence... Um, example number three on page 190, provisional IRA abducted a man. His family had no idea where he was or what happened to him. They spent years searching for him. The security forces had intelligence that the victim had been murdered, but in days of, of, of his disappearance, didn't inform the family and no efforts to find him um, and, and didn't carry out a murder investigation. That's Jesus Christ. I mean, like the, the, the family, you, you, you could at least let the family feckin' know so they're not wandering the, the bloody streets looking for, for someone, you know? You'd let them know he was dead, wouldn't you? I mean, yeah, Rachel, let, them, let the family know he was dead as well. I mean, they're not... I mean, I'm a former IRA volunteer, but you have sometimes to say these guys... These guys, some of these guys were out of control. They were the antithesis of what Republicanism was all about. Many of these guys, you know, they were police agents. And in, a, in a fact, they weren't. They weren't, really, they weren't working for the IRA. They were working for the Brits. They put on this facade that they, I know them. I know who I'm talking about here. I know them personally. Right? I know them up in the squad. I know most of them. And they were put on this facade that they were staunch Republicans. And they were far from it. They were all working for the other side. And good lads. I mean, God knows how many innocent volunteers were killed in this process. 
Um, we know we know for sure of two. We know of of of, of, uh, of uh, young young Kearney, young Michael Kearney. We know of Anthony Braff. Those are only two. There's a there's a, I'm quite I'd be quite adamant that there's more, right? And I think also I mean I think I think it's important that the IRA gets to the bottom of this. That refers there's not much of an IRA they have to be honest. If they're maybe a handful of guys who would see themselves as an army council, maybe I'm not even sure that that's the case. But if such a body is, is still in existence, they should they should look at all of this, and they should look at all of this with a view to, as Boucher said, to apologise, because they don't know who were agents and who wasn't. That we we now find that out. People were tortured here. Most of this nothing squad are all dead, right? Most of them's dead. But people were tortured here and they're making confessions and they're talking into a recording device and an actual fact they were saying in their own death warrant. And all those factors alone should act as a catalyst for what's the first for what's left of the IRA. And again, I as a keep saying yeah. I I don't know if there even is one. If there's a body that believes to be believes itself to be the IRA, but if there is, if the divisional IRA, if there is, they should apologize for the right reasons because it's the right thing to do. Right? British agents murdered these guys. There's a lot of you have to assume that quite a few of them were innocent. You you most definitely got to accept that a lot of them were tortured and to making confessions. And on that basis alone, it's the right thing to do to say, we got it wrong. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with saying we got it wrong if you did get it wrong. People will think a lot better of you. Um, th there, was, um there was a few kind of um, myths or falsehoods that the... The, the team felt like uh felt like kind of striking down in the report one of them was this uh this claim that, that you would hear before that that scap saved like hundreds of lives they said in fact it's more like high single digits or low double digits and due to the fact that so many lives were lost because he was in operation as an agent um it's probably it's probably like like a negative number it's it, it's probably more uh, it's probably more the case that the more people died than than were saved. That that was that was a, a a nice admission anyway. When I when I wrote the book, I, I specifically looked for that. I looked for instances where it's recorded that he saved lives. He saved the life of a young a, a, a young a young agent in 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 Derry called Carlin, Willie Carlin. Saved his life. He was actually coming up from Belfast to arrest him that night. And Carlin was close to McGinnis, if you remember. He wrote, and, a book, right? he wrote a book, did he? He wrote a book, yeah, he wrote a book. And he, in, uh, in the state knife, Scapatici told his family, this guy's going to, he's going to get chat there, he's going to get nutted. So they got Carlin offside, and he got offside in Thatcher's own private plane. And then there was another, uh, there was another, they tried to make another intervention down in South Armagh, and they messed it up. And the rag got away with the guy, and the guy ended up shot dead. But I find, I mean, I couldn't find any more. Now, obviously, I didn't have access to security force files, and there could well have been more. But I did have access to a, 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 a statement from a, a free a free guy who was directly handling Scapatici, and he said he saved hundreds of lives. And I said in my book, I have no evidence. There's no evidence of this at all. Uh, there just isn't. There's evidence, all right, that he was involved in dozens. I mean, dozens of killings. Now, I going to say that he didn't actually always pull the trigger. I think he pulled the trigger one or two, but that was it. But it, on his recommendation and on the on the, on the Nutting Squad's recommendation, people were shot dead. So he was. What means that he was he was culpable. And uh, so he was involved in dozens of getting killed, but I, I didn't see any evidence at all that he saved any more than a handful of lives at the most. But just the evidence wasn't there. And it would have been, had it been the case, I think it would have been exclaimed from the rooftops. I was going to say, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very tough thing to measure. Like, like I've heard, 
I've heard, for example, that um that Don Tidy was found as a result of um of of scaps. So, so yeah, I, I I don't know if you would count if you would count them and stuff. It, it's a, it's kind of a, a tough thing to do. Um, I, on, sorry, I doubt with Don, sorry, I doubt with Don Tidy in the book. I don't think Scabatici would have known anything about Don Tidy. Really? Okay. That would have been a way beyond his remit. Um, but he he actually it was claimed some of the some of the the fruit guys claimed that he was involved in three or four kidnappings. I don't accept that at all. That's what that's not what Scabatici was about. I, you know, he just wouldn't have been and um. And all these things, it's difficult to separate the reality from the myth and from from the falsehoods. But the the the, the one reality we have is that, according to Boucher, he was involved in seventeen murders. I'm not saying that Boucher's saying that, right? I, mean, I believe he was involved in more, but at least seventeen murders, right? And that's the reality. Boucher says that he was involved and in, he made a saved uh, low nine or ten lives. He might have he said didn't strike me as a man who had any evidence that that was even the case. He said he might have, he didn't say for sure. So this guy was a killing machine. And he had he had a body of people around him who were aiding and abetting them in that killing, right? And the body of people, okay, it included the Army Council of the IRA, but it also included the the task and coordinating group who were working in concert with the, the, the Army Council of the original IRA. This is a joint enterprise. If this went to a trial, they would all be in the dock. If there was evidence, I mean, they would not they would not be standing at the back of the dock like the PC McGarry number two nine three. They would be in the thump. They would be in the thing. Right. Um. Yeah. Okay. There, there was there was one or two um other according to the the investigation team falsehoods that got addressed and one of them they actually um they actually called out um the Harkin and Ingram book by name and they said that there was um <clears throat> there was a theory put forth by Brian Nelson that uh that he got like a list of. Uh, a list of like prominent Republicans that were to be targeted, uh, scapping one of them, and that he uh, he he told his handlers, and they kind of guided the loyalists away. Um, in, in the report, it just simply says, "I quote: This did not happen. No um, no kind of uh, no, no elaboration on it. Yeah, I just found that interesting. They also said that um, claims that scap met with Thatcher, um, at a certain place were were as well. Yeah, and uh, okay, so and then on like page one seven two, they they said okay, we we spoke to a bunch of senior leaders, including uh, PMs, government ministers, commanders, and all that, and that those in senior government and security force positions did not have any knowledge of the alleged Asian steak knife. Um, j- just in your own opinion, do you think do you think these higher up kind of fellas would have known about this like specific agent? Oh, absolutely. Very Scarpatici was too important. The tasking and coordinating group would have had to report to someone. That's the way this system works. It works at different levels. Okay, tasking and coordinating group would have been in, in coordinating all activity in the north. But there was the British Irish Secretariat, I think you called it, and it was it was above them again, and it was uh, it was run by MI5 from Stormont, and they reported directly to the cabinet office in London. So. All of this, all of this would have been. It, it is absolutely inconceivable that the reports for Scapatici's activities would not have crossed the desk of the uh, the Mandarins and and Whitehall. Whether Thatcher knew about it is another matter. What we do know about Thatcher is that uh, I'm a former head of special branch called White. Uh, made her aware that agents were involved in very serious crime. And the nature of the beast was that they had to be involved in serious crime. Otherwise, those who were involved with them in in, in, in the various uh, paramilitary bodies would suspect they were agents. So, and Thatcher, and Thatcher told us, told the fella, who told this cop, that, well, just don't get caught. 
My love, those are his words, not mine. And that was on in John Moore's uh, Spy in the IRA program. Um, so this went the whole, my idea is that this went the whole way to 10 Downing Street. I'm, I'm convinced that the Scrapatisi stuff I went the whole way to 10 Downing Street. Thatcher was one of those people who had a finger in every family. She wouldn't have, she would not have um, not had a, a handle on this, in my view, and she would have been well aware that the agents were involved in killing and executions and in murder. Um, th there's a part. There's another interesting part of the report. Um, it's around kind of page one eight eight. He goes through some of the definitions of collusion that get put forward in like Stevens reports, the Stalker, and so on. <clears throat> So we go through a few of them. It says, um, I would not argue with any of the above definitions, but I would caution that they tend to capture a much wider range of conduct than comes to mind people's minds when they hear the word collusion. In the Northern Ireland uh, legacy context, many understand collusion to refer to security forces actively helping or using terrorists as instruments to achieve their own ends, rather than turning a blind eye to what a terrorist may have done or may be about to do. I fully appreciate that omissions can be just as culpable as acts indeed uh, just couple of acts indeed as a member of security force sworn to protect life turning a blind eye to terrorism is almost as apparent to me as uh, proactively assisting and then later on that page th this is the interesting part I, I found it says um where i've found culpable acts and omissions on the part of security forces i will call them out and address them in my final case specific reports and in discussions with uh, those forces and the affected uh, family victim. If the term collusion needs to be used, I will not shy away from using it, but neither will I use it, will I do so too readily, or if I think it would simply, it would be fair or simply to find facts and let them speak for themselves. I do not see it as a part of my role to apply a label or tick a box mark, mark collusion simply for the sake of it, and I'm aware of getting drawn into territory that is so bedeviled by definitional uncertainty. That seems to me it's kind of a uh, Kind of leaving the door open for them to present things that may be kind of objectively speaking collusion, but 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 to not actually use that word or use the term. Did, did it seem that way to you? I think you've got it spot on. I think what what Bircher is saying there is that I'm not going to get I'm not going to get tied down with the label collusion because collusion and over here is such with permutations. And it's, it's been used so often, and it's been used usually in a correct manner. I mean, you, you spoke there of, of Brian Nelson. Brian Nelson was a UDA man who was working, UDA intelligence leader, who was working hand in hand with the three, and he was targeting nationalists, not just Republicans, he was targeting nationalists and facilitating the murder of both. And, at the behest of 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 a key in the task and coordinating group, they need they weren't just involved with Freddy Scapatiche. They were involved with everything. They were involved with the loyalist murder gangs. They were involved with the ambushes of IRA volunteers going out in operations. They were totally on the ball in relation to all acts, security force acts, and even specifically when they didn't act. So it wasn't as if these guys hadn't got their finger and they weren't colluding in, 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 in wholesale murder of Catholics or whatever. But Boucher is, Boucher is being very succinct. He's actually saying, I'm going to present a set of facts that will speak for themselves and they will be irrefutable. And you can reach any conclusion you want. If you want to use the word conclusion, I can't stop you, but I'm going to present in the final report a set of facts that clearly demonstrate that members of the security forces had it in their power, had it in their gift to save numerous lives, and they didn't do so. And if you want to call that collusion, so be it. If you don't, if you have another term for it, so be that as well. That's basically what he's saying there. He's basically saying, I'm not going to be harnessed. I'm not going to pull my report. I'm going to say exactly what I have said to the relatives, right? Where there is, where there was a case, as a case 
of Michael Kearney in the case of Anthony Bramlett and Anthony McCarran and I don't know who else. But where there was opportunity to intervene and save life, and an opportunity wasn't taken, and consequently that life was taken, he's going to say that's what happened. And I call it whatever you wish. Okay. Um just uh just worth mentioning um i'm not sure what the figure do, do you remember off the top of your head what, what the figure uh, millions spent on it was yeah 38 million 38 mil okay so so with that in mind on, on page 175 um they said canova has uh, has pursued uh, more than 12,000 lines of inquiry taken more than 2,000 statements interviewed some 300 people uh, over 40 under caution conducted comprehensive forensic uh, reviews in more than 80 cases and submitted 35 files to the PPS and I uh, covering in excess 50,000 uh, pages of evidence. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and somewhere else they said that they reviewed 90% of, um, of, uh, of like state uh, of state knives, um, uh, of state knives, like, like written, uh, written material. D do you think, um, I, you 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 you've uh, you you obviously weren't in the team or anything. Do, do you think they actually did get like ninety percent of uh, of stake? Well, they were very lucky getting that because um, and I wrote about this. I wrote an article about this in the Belfast Telegraph. The Tashkin and Coordinating Group destroyed everything. They destroyed all their records, right? They destroyed minutes of their meetings. They destroyed their decision making processes. Everything. When Canova went to the RUC and says, I want to see the Tosken and Coordinating Group files, they said there was none. There wasn't even a page and a jotter. Right? Now, that doesn't come from me. That came from the Public Prosecution Service. Right? And they give a, a most lamest excuse, the, the lamest excuse you ever heard of in your life. They said because things were moving so fast, they didn't keep any records. These guys never had any meetings. These guys never sat down and said, "What's our? What are we going to do today? What's what's on the agenda? Is there anybody taking notes? They, they didn't do that, right? So, but Voucher was lucky because MI five meticulously keeps notes, and through I, I don't know how he got access to it, but he got access to. Uh, a place in uh, an MI5 storeroom in London called the Vault. And the Vault is a place where they have 10 million files and 10 to 12 million files. And in those files was most, if not, 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 maybe not all, I don't know how, how money, but he says 90%. I would take the guy's word for it. He got most of the files relating to steak knife. So you'd, what MI5 also done was because they would have sat in on the task in the coordinating group, because they were part of them. So they obviously kept their fans while the RUC destroyed theirs. They, they kept their notes. So he was able to get their notes, and hence he was able to see when calls were made, when calls were not made to the handlers, who could have been saved, who couldn't have been saved. So when he says he got 90%, I, I would tend to believe him. But... That, that, we, we, we do have to bear me that the, the special branch point of everything. Um, I, we're, we're, we're coming close-ish to the end there. I won't keep it too long. Is, is there anything else about the report that you feel is kind of worth mentioning or we didn't go over, people overlooking or something? I, I mean, my, my, my view is that the report has been fantastic. My view, I mean, the, the report... I, when I was initially talking about this, I thought the report was going to be a whitewash, and it isn't a whitewash. And I just, I mean, I couldn't believe that a British police officer would be as frank and as open as Boucher. And he was, and he was true to the, his word. And to me, uh, to me, John, that was the overwhelming, that was my overwhelming feel, uh, uh, feeling about the whole thing. That uh, this guy had been true to his word and he was true to the families. That he didn't get prosecutions wasn't his fault. Right? He believed that 
the, there was enough evidence to warrant prosecutions in, in many cases, right? And I can't see how they I mean, have to say this. I can't see how there have been many Republicans being prosecuted. Was there any evidence that's there? You talked about new evidence because most of the nothing squad are dead, right? Cody Mulligan's dead, John Joe McGee's dead, Scap's dead, there's other guys dead, right? Most of them's dead, so you're hardly going to get prosecutions against them. So you have to assume that the prosecutions that he felt comfortable with obtaining is um, those from the security forces, but the PPS said there wasn't enough evidence. And Preacher made it very clear that in his view it was. Um, okay, so I mean, I, I am I'm slightly hesitant to kind of uh kind of pass like 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 final judgment on the on the report just given that given that we've been told that in two to three months there'll be a final one that that will have case specific stuff are you holding out um are you holding out much hope that we'll get like like good kind of satisfying detail about about various cases in the next one well i am i am um it's already it's already uh told the families the details surrounding the deaths of their loved ones and this is and, and and this is going to be the subject of judicial proceedings, as I know for certain that the, the solicitor for the families, Kevin Winters, has taken a judicial review around why the the Branoff, uh, the Branoff family were not told uh, uh, after 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 Scapatici or whoever told their hunger that this lad was going to be shot dead. I know for certain that the Branagh family are taking a judicial review uh, and around the circumstances surrounding Anthony's death. So it's this is this is a process. This is only the start of the process. This is going to go on, and these uh, this is I I, I just don't, I think you and I could well be having this conversation at a future date. I, I was gonna say when when the final one comes out, we'll we'll definitely speak again. Yeah, um, yeah, and 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 Seamus, uh, and I, I I might I might speak with Seamus then after they get the the final one to to kind of tie a tie a bit of a knot on on his brother's case to to, to some degree anyway. I think it's important to say that Big Jimmy Kearney has been a champion here. He has he has fought his brother's case with vigor and honor, and he deserves to be. Held in the highest esteem because of it. For de for decades, he did it now, and and, and I mean the, the beginning of his journey was just proving, uh, proving that he wasn't an informant. I mean he, he had to live he had to live for years with the with the shame of, of thinking that 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 his that his own brother was. He what what a what a roller coaster, boy, huh? Yeah, yeah, and he fought he fought he fought he fought the fight for him, and he, he cleared his brother's name and. He's to be admired for that. You know, he's the next he's the next comrade of mine. We were both banquet man. And um he's a great singer. You should give him the singer next time he's on. He he can <laughs> he knows brand for it. But um but he's to be big shame he's to be to be admired. I, I, I really admire him. I think a word of him. You got any um any kind of uh, parting thoughts or words there? Any anything no, we, we no, don't John, and I'm just I'm, I'm, as I say this will be, uh, I suspect this will be my last podcast because I'm getting tired of them, to be honest with you, for a while anyway. But um, I'm just happy that, I'm happy the way it turned out. I, I, I'm, I'm turning it a lot better than I thought it would. Okay, okay, very good. Um, we, we'll uh, we, we'll hopefully speak again uh, when the final one comes out, if, if you're not too sick of uh, interviews. I will, but that stage will be refer renewed. So anyway, thank you very much. Um, thanks for joining me. Anyone who anyone who's interested in this case, uh, the the li a link for the the book is in the is in the description. By far, by far the best um like single collection of all the the various theories explored and information about Scap, e e easily the best um the best source out there at the moment. John, thank you so much. Thanks very much. Appreciate the time.